Washington, Bolivar, Ho Chi Minh, and Ansark. All men who did their best to free their nations from colonial pressure from the outside. While some who fought the colonial powers are remembered fondly, the period of the Yemen emergency has left a scar on the history of the Middle East that has yet to heal. From 1963 to 1967, the modern territory of Yemen was characterized by a series of insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, and political turmoil. We will examine the causes and consequences of the Aden emergency, as well as the strategies and tactics used by both sides during the conflict. In the 1830s, Britain was in the market for a coal depot to service their steamships as they sailed to their colony in India. They considered cities and villages all over the Red Sea and landed on Aden in Yemen. They tried to negotiate a deal with a local sultan where they would be allowed to use Aden's port, but their deal was rejected. The British being the British didn't let that stop them. And so they went to another sultan and managed to get him to agree to allow them to use the port. Naturally, getting their way wasn't enough, however. They wanted full control over the port, but knew they couldn't take it by force without sufficient reason or fear of starting a conflict. Their opportunity, however, came in 1838, when a British trading ship passing by Aden was attacked by local Arab pirates, who plundered the goods and sank the boat. Losing the boat was more valuable to the British than keeping what was on board. In January of 1839, they seized their opportunity to retaliate by dispatching a warship from India to attack Aden. Though the Yemeni guards tried to defend the port, the firepower of the British was overwhelming, and there was little they could do. Not wanting to seem like the bad guys, they forced the Sultan they previously made a deal with to accept their protection and give them full control over Aden in exchange for a yearly fee. Faced with the famed British diplomacy, the Sultan had no choice but to agree, and Aden became the center of what was called the Aden Protectorate. From the very beginning, the British presence was met with extreme hostility from the locals, who had already faced centuries of subjugation from the Ottomans. It didn't take long for things to reach a boiling point, and in November 1839, 5,000 local tribesmen tried to retake Aden. The British fought the morph and killed 200 before they decided to retreat. Still, the British realized that if their presence in Aden was to live long and prosper, they would need to make friends with the nine tribes that surrounded Port City or deal with being attacked every few months. So, they drafted what were called protection and friendship treaties with the tribes. These treaties guaranteed that the tribes would not live under British rule or be subject to British interference in their affairs. In exchange, the tribes would not be allowed to carry out business with any other non-Arab colonial powers, like the French or the Dutch. Though these treaties started out as informal, the agreements were largely honored by both sides. However, the Ottomans were not happy with the British increasing their presence in the region. They asserted that, even though they no longer had direct control over Yemen, they held sovereignty over the entire Arabian Peninsula because they were successors to Muhammad, and it was their right. Regardless of the Ottomans' posturing, the British held on to their protectorate, a grip that only became stronger once the Suez Canal opened up in 1869 and Aden's strategic value skyrocketed. Thanks to the canal, Aden turned into one of the busiest trading ports in the world. It remained under the control of British India until 1937, when it was officially designated as a crown colony. After Britain finally granted independence to India in 1947, Aden became somewhat less important to it. But still, Britain held on because of the strategic value its proximity to the Suez Canal gave it. However, its influence on the canal wouldn't last forever. In order to properly tell this story, we need to turn our attention away from Yemen for a moment and look across the Red Sea to Egypt, where, in July 1956, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser announced his intention to nationalize the Suez Canal. This was a major blow to Britain and France. At the time, the canal was owned and operated by the Suez Canal Company, which was primarily owned by Britain and France. The former Chancellor of Germany, Otto von Bismarck, once called the Suez Canal the spinal cord of the British Empire. Nasser's announcement was a major slap in the face to the colonial powers, but that was the point. Nasser was one of the leaders of a massive wave of Arab nationalism that was currently sweeping across the Arab world. His only real goal was to free the Arab world of its colonial overlords who didn't care about the Arab people or their interests at all. Nasser's announcement was popular with people all over the Middle East and North Africa, and his move was perfectly legal. His government would buy out all the shareholders of the Suez Canal Company at a fair price. 
That was most certainly not good for Britain and France. Their main concerns were their ability to obtain oil from the region and stay in control. They still wanted to remain the major powers they had been historically. But with the Cold War in full swing, it was obvious that they were being dethroned in favor of the United States and the Soviet Union. The British Prime Minister at the time, Anthony Eden, equated Nasser to the likes of Hitler and Stalin, an authoritarian and a major problem that had to be dealt with, and France agreed. So, in August 1956, Britain held a conference in London, which 22 nations attended, to discuss the matter of the canal. 18 of the 22 countries agreed that Nasser should not take the canal, but the U.S. emphasized that they would not support any military action against Nasser because it could push him into the hands of the USSR. With the U.S. firmly putting its foot down, Britain and France lost any tangible support they could have hoped for. If they wanted to maintain control of the canal and get rid of Nasser, they would have to get creative. So, that's exactly what they did. They enlisted the help of Israel, a new country that was seen as illegitimate by much of the Arab world. Since Israel was Egypt's neighbor and had some semblance of a reason to invade, Britain and France had the newly formed country do just that. On October 29th, Israel landed troops in Sinai to pave the way for a ground invasion of Egypt. When questioned by the UN, they claimed that their move was in self-defense because they had been attacked by Palestinian fighters located in Sinai and Gaza. But that was a lie. Britain and France used the story as a way to step in and pretend to be the heroes. They told Israel and Egypt to stop fighting and to withdraw their troops within 24 hours, or they would intervene. In doing so, they were effectively forcing the Egyptians to retreat from the Suez Canal. Israel, of course, accepted the terms, but Egypt refused, seeing right through the conspiracy. In response, the British and French navies got to work bombing Egyptian airfields and infrastructure. On November 5th, they sent paratroopers into the Suez Canal to try and seize control. The Egyptian military was in no way prepared to face the much larger and better equipped armies of Britain and France. They did what they could to resist the aggressors, but they stood no real chance. In two days, 26 British and French military personnel were killed, compared to 600 Egyptian, with a further 1,000 civilians killed and even more displaced as A of the shelling. The plot to take back the canal was not a very well-kept secret, and it didn't take long for the international community to figure out what was going on. Britain and France were pretty much universally condemned. What they did was so bad that the Americans and Soviets actually agreed on something. On November 7th, all sides agreed to a ceasefire. Britain and France were forced to withdraw from the canal entirely, and control of it was given back to the Egyptians. Britain was thoroughly humiliated by the whole ordeal, and their power on the world stage was significantly diminished as a result. However, on the other side, Arab nationalism was strengthened not only in Egypt, but across the Arab world, just like NASA wanted. NASA's success in the Suez Crisis set in motion a massive wave of Arab nationalism across North Africa and the Middle East. It's unclear how much influence this wave had on the events of Yemen, but it's clear that it had at least some impact. By the late 1950s and going into the 60s, there was a lot of anti-colonial sentiment ready to boil over in Yemen. After their humiliation in Egypt, things weren't looking good for the British. Now that Britain had lost control of the Suez Canal, they doubled down on its presence in Aden, desperate to hold on to what little international power they had left. To maintain control, they began negotiating with the feuding emirs, the local tribe leaders, to get them to come together under the British crown to form a new country called the Federation of South Arabia. At the time, Yemen was divided in two countries, North Yemen and South Yemen. South Yemen was larger and part of the British protectorate, and that's the territory that would have become part of the Federation. Though they were able to do this successfully, it was too little too late for them because the emirs didn't reflect the will of the people. And like so many colonized people in the world during the 20th century, the people of Yemen were fed up with being subjugated by a foreign power. The British needed to retain control of the region, so they planned to take control of the Congress, or ATUKI. Founded in 1956, the ATUC was created to help tame the labor unrest the region was experiencing at the time. Its secretary general was a man named Abdullah Asnag, a massive supporter of NASA, as well as an Arab nationalist who supported the union of all countries on the Arabian Peninsula. The union gained importance in its first few years, as it was the only nationalist organization that wasn't stamped out by the British. When the Federation of South Yemen was formed in 1962, the ATUC held a lot of influence in the National Assembly, which was dangerous for British interests in Aden. To counter it, they added the colony of Aden to the Federation in order to add more pro-British sentiment to the Assembly. 
But the day after the colony of Aden joined the Federation, the king of the Kingdom of Yemen, which encompassed the North and South, Muhammad al-Baud, was overthrown by rebels, plunging the region into civil war that was mostly concentrated in North Yemen. However, the conflict was so big and fierce, it bled into the Federation of South Yemen, kicking off what the British called the Aden Emergency. By 1963, there were multiple anti-British guerrilla groups forming across the country. All across South Yemen, these new guerrilla troops were diametrically opposed in their ideologies and what their visions for the future of Yemen would look like, but they agreed on one thing, they hated the British. So the various groups began to consolidate until two larger organizations formed, the National Liberation Front, NLF, and the Front for the Liberation of South Yemen, FLOSY. The NLF was a Marxist paramilitary group who were largely responsible for the downfall of the Yemenese monarchy. They were financially backed by Nasser and operated in both North and South Yemen. FLOSY, by comparison, was an Arab nationalist group created by Abdullah al asnag in response to the British consolidating power in the region. Like the NLF, they were backed by Nasser, but the two organizations couldn't see eye to eye. Though they teamed up to fight the British, they were often fighting amongst themselves as well, because each wanted control of the region once the British were gone. The emergency officially began on December 14, 1963, when Sir Kennedy Traviscus, the British High Commissioner to Aden, had an NLF grenade launched his way as he arrived at the airport in Aden to head to London. Two people were killed, including the commissioner's advisor, who pushed him out of the way to save his life. A further 50 people were injured in the attack, but the commissioner lived. The attack prompted the British to issue a state of emergency in Aden, and attacks against them by the NLF and FLOSY became more and more frequent. They were mostly focused on off-duty British policemen and officers, though attacks against other members of the British populace were also common. One such attack was at a children's party at the Royal Air Force Station in Aden in December 1964. Members of the NLF threw grenades into the party, which ultimately killed the young daughter of Air Commodore E. Saidi and wounded four other children. This was part of a broader series of attacks that happened around the Christmas festivities that year. On Boxing Day, Inspector Fadal Khalil of Aden's Special Branch, which was part of the British military, was shot dead at the bazaar in Crater Town within Aden. For the NLF and FLOSY, anyone who worked with the British was an enemy, even fellow Arabs. Crater Town was the biggest hotspot for attacks against British officers, so much so that the British tried to stop the import of weapons into that part of Aden, but found little success. The attacks became such a problem that British had to bring in outside help, like the 24th Infantry Brigade, which had been active in both world wars. By 1965, the RAF station in Aden was home to nine different squadrons, which included Hawker Hunter aircraft and ground transport units. They were used to defend the British, as well as attack the NLF and FLOSY bases. The Hawker Hunters, in particular, were used to launch 60-pound high-explosive rockets. The violence from both sides continued into the following years. In January 1967, in order to try something new, the NLF instigated street riots in Aden. The police quickly lost control of the situation, so British High Commissioner Sir Richard Turnbull brought in troops to squash the riots. While they were successful in crushing the NLF's riots within 48 hours of their start, the fight wasn't over yet, because FLOSY joined in, and violence continued well into February. During that time, British forces opened fire 40 times, and there were 60 shootings and grenade attacks against British forces. There was even an attack on Aden Airways' Douglas DC-3, which was bombed mid-flight, leading to the death of everyone on board. In June 1967, NASA accused the British of aiding Israel during the Six-Day War, which was fought between Israel and several United Arab states. That accusation was the final straw for many of the Arab people who worked for the British in Aden, and they mutinied. It started in the South Arabian Army, who set fire to their barracks and attacked a truck transporting 60 British soldiers, killing eight of them. The SAA didn't accomplish much else before the mutiny was stopped by the British Army, but it was already too late. The Aden police quickly followed suit. They took control of their barracks in the crater district of Aden, firing on passing British patrols from their windows. They killed 22 British soldiers and even shot down a helicopter. Their success allowed rebel forces to occupy the area, which in turn led to the Battle of Crater. Caught off guard by the occupation, British forces were ordered to withdraw from Crater. In the meantime, Royal Marines of 45 Commando took up sniping positions around the area and killed 10 armed Arab fighters. However, it had little impact. 
and Crater remained occupied by around 400 Arab fighters. NLF and Flosi fighters used this time to take to the streets and engage in gun battles, along with arson and murder. To try and regain control, British forces blocked off the two main entrances to Crater, but they weren't able to do so until July 1967, when the first Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders entered Crater under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Colin Campbell Mitchell, who managed to retake the entire district overnight without casualties. But at that time, it didn't matter much. The British could see that they were fighting a losing battle as the attacks continued even after they regained control of the district, so they began to withdraw from Arden. By November 1967, they were gone for good. They left without reaching any agreement as to who would govern South Yemen upon their departure. So once they were gone, the NLF seized power and created the People's Republic of South Yemen, which would remain a sovereign state until 1990. The Arden Emergency lasted from 1963 to 1967 and saw many casualties, but it's difficult to know just how many there were. On the British side, there were anywhere between 90 to 92 deaths of soldiers, with a further 510 injured. The British also lost 17 civilians and 17 members of the local government. On the rebel side, there were an estimated 382 deaths and 1,714 injured. Despite the British desperation to maintain control in the Suez region, their power post, World War II just wasn't what it used to be, and the will of the people in Yemen was stronger. But what do you think? Do you think the British ever had any hope of maintaining control of Arden or any of their other colonies? What do you think about the story of Yemen and the current state it's in?